So we are nearing the end of the summer, our primary gardening season, and all of our hard work as gardeners and plant people is hopefully paying off, fingers crossed. And I hope that you are enjoying handfuls of cherry tomatoes, delicious fresh salads, sweet corn right off the stock, and delightful bouquets of cut flowers. Whether you're growing them yourself or getting them at the farmer's markets, they're all over the place right now. I have really enjoyed diving deep in gardening in the My First Garden series on this podcast this summer, and I really want to celebrate our hard work all summer in a different way in this episode that we share with you today, because not only is growing your own food a fabulous hobby and a way to reconnect with the food chain, with the earth, and with yourself, but Plant Friends, it's also a wonderful way for us to serve our bodies in a deeper way by feeding them with fresh organic produce and not to mention a freshly picked cherry tomato or a piece of lettuce right out of the garden tastes infinitely more delicious than a store-bought one. If you know, you know. It's that simple. And our guest today really enlightens us on so many interesting aspects of the food that we grow. Dr. John LaPuma, I met him on Clubhouse this year, and I was so impressed with John's career as both a trained chef and a doctor and his commitment to culinary medicine, which was something I didn't know much about. And I figured what better time to have a guest on the show to discuss the nutritional value of the foods that we are growing and strategies to make sure that we're getting the most nutritional value out of that organic produce that we have worked so hard to grow ourselves. So today's episode is super fun. John, as an expert, shares us so many interesting fun facts about the food that we're growing, but we also riff on fun ways to prepare our harvests. John and I are both Italian-American and have a lot of recipes to share, particularly John. I only throw in Mama Fiala's recipes here and there. And we hope that they inspire you for when you're looking at your epic garden harvests that are sitting on your counter begging not to go bad. And I think you'll also really enjoy how humble John likes to keep me <laughs> in our friendship if you stay tuned until the end of the episode when we get into discussing TikTok. So plant friends, welcome to episode 131 of Blue Mango Radio. Hello, my sweet plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. We have moved again and are settling into our new home in the Catskills. Man, I've got so many plants and figuring out again where to put them has been a real (laughs) hoot, I guess we can call it. But I have to say the last time we moved was January of 2021 and man, moving in the summer is a lot easier than moving in the winter. I'll just say that. So I'm thankful and happy to be settling in. I'm so excited to share this conversation. It's a little bit different because it is more food-based, but it's centered around things that we grow in our garden, and then how to prepare them and capitalize off of their nutrition. Dr. John LaPuma is so awesome. Can't wait for you to meet him. So without further ado, my plant friends, here's Dr. John LaPuma. And please tag us on Instagram when you cook some of the recipes we talk about today, or if you employ some of the strategies we discussed, because at the end of this episode, I'll tell you what I've been doing since I spoke to John. Okay. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio, John. I'm so excited to finally introduce you to the audience after having you as my Italian friend for several months now. Yes, although I claim to be Italian-American, my grandfather would roll over in his grave. (laughs) It's so fun because we met actually on Clubhouse. We did. Yeah. Did you read about the thing at the times where those people met on Clubhouse and got married? What? No, I didn't read that. they They were in a room together and... One liked the sound of the other's voice, and a year later, 27,000 people came to their wedding reception celebration on Clubhouse. On Clubhouse? Yeah, it was in the Times in mid-July. Wow, that's a powerful app. I found it's been so fun for networking. I've had several people I've met on Clubhouse on the podcast, and you and I have a few projects in the works and, and such a fun budding friendship. So before I ask you to tell us all about who you are and how you became this like epic farm owner that you are. I have to tell you about what I ate today because we're going to talk about culinary medicine and I just made the most delicious dinner for my garden. And I think you're going to be really proud. So I diced up kohlrabi, which is such a fun plant to grow and then eat. Wow. I'm already impressed. Kohlrabi, green beans, which were plucked from the garden, broccoli plucked from the garden, and then garlic and onions, which I did not grow. And then I made a stir fry sauce of 
rice, wine, vinegar, coconut aminos, a little bit of honey and sesame oil. And I just like sauteed all of that stuff and it was so good, but there was such ownership over the fact that I grew it. That is so terrific, Maria. You are doing a great job. Most people can't even pronounce kohlrabi, much less grow and cook it. <laughs> Congratulations. That's a great vegetable. And it's so adaptable. Uh, I first met kohlrabi about 20 years ago in a farmer's market in uh, rural Illinois. And I thought it looked like it was an alien. Totally. It came it's a weird a plant. Spaceship. It really mm -hmm. is. Purple stalks and green bulb and you slice into it and it's it has the density of jicama and some of the bitterness of cabbage, but it also is fresh and refreshing like cucumber. It was really a wonderful find. And how great of you. I love that recipe. You'll have to put it on your blog. What's your favorite way to eat kohlrabi? Raw. I like it as a, as a crudite. I like it diced, sprinkled with lemon, salt, and chili pepper, and then dunked into guacamole. Oh my God, that sounds amazing. So you cut it thin like almost a chip. Exactly. Or like a baton. <gasps> oh, I'm going to try that. We have more. I also love the way they grow, like their little bulbs that kind of sit on top of the soil. Like they do. They look totally weird. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, onions do that too, of course. And I know you didn't grow the onion, but this year we grew white and yellow and red onions. I grew about a hundred of them. They're all drying and about a hundred garlic too. And it's the second year I've grown onions and just the flavor differences, you know, onions you can buy in the store for 60 cents a pound. And they're thought of as a commodity, even organic ones for a dollar pound. But the flavor differences, if you grow your own, are remarkable. Really? I'm so impressed with this. Yes. It does have to do with variety. Different varieties of onions taste differently. And they have different polyphenols and chemicals, as you know, that are beneficial. But you can get onions that you won't find commercially because they don't travel well. And those onions, the species of onions, have better flavor characteristics and sometimes more bruisability. But if you're pulling it just from your backyard and letting it dry, that's all up to you. Do you have a variety that you would recommend people trying that they wouldn't necessarily find like in the store or at a, you know, in a nursery? It kind of depends on if you have short days, intermediate days, or long days. So onions are programmed by how much time in the soil they need. There's one called Texas Harvester that is just as big as Texas and just as sweet that I love a lot. Oh, that's awesome. So you've alluded to the fact that you grow a ton of food on your farm. Do you want to tell us all a little bit? You're such an interesting guy, doctor turned culinary medicinal chef turned eco-medicine guru turned, you know, best-selling author. So can you give us a little bit of insight on your incredibly epic planty journey? I don't know that I have that much of an epic journey, but I have always thought about the way to help people in a, as a continuum, I went to medical school and then I went to cooking school and then I did media for PBS and Lifetime and wrote books in each of these stages. And then most recently, I've been interested in how plants grow and how they affect the body and the brain. And at each stage, it seems to me that the experience has been additive. When I take care of patients, I'm really interested in the details of what their medical problems are and how they came about and who they are as people. When I cook, I'm really interested in what the dish looks like when I'm cooking it, what it smells like, what the colors are, how it changes in the pan or the pot, because it tells me a little bit about the flavor. And when I take care of plants, whether the avocado trees that we grow or the rare citrus or any of the other 50 or more varieties of fruit and vegetable that we grow in our little three-acre urban regenerative organic farm here in Santa Barbara, observation is also the key. If you're a good observer, you could be a great doctor, a great chef, or a great gardener. And uh, I just try to uh, learn as I go and teach people those observational skills. That's awesome. And now you're like you mentioned, very into eco-medicine. So you talk a lot about eco-medicine and comfort nature. So can you kind of break down what both of those things are? Eco-medicine is actually a new field in medicine. And it scares people because it's very sciencey sounding, but it really just means that your health and the health of the planet are two sides of the same coin. That is because the planet is getting sicker in so many ways in with climate change and with the change in degradation of the soil and with the air and noise pollution that we've spoken about previously, because the planet is getting sicker, 
we are getting sicker. You know, COVID-19 came about because of a, a illness that was transmitted as a zoonosis in, in animals that were kept for food in China. And that's a kind of bastardization of how animals ought to be treated. It's also uh, directly resulted in creating a virus that was now transmissible to people and is still wreaking havoc worldwide. So eco-medicine says, if we make the planet better, our own health will become better. And the way to primarily do that, to do that best, is to get outside and know that we are actually part of nature, not apart from it. And if we're a part of nature, then naturally we wouldn't want to exploit it and and just extract things from it. We would want to nurture it and be respectful of it because that's what you do with people who you love. And we, for better or worse, need to love the planet because we are part of it. So in that way, we teach about not just the things that are popular, forest bathing and gardening and therapeutic horticulture and hiking and adventure therapy and wilderness therapy, but also things that really are less well-known but are becoming more popular, birding and surf therapy and, and even free play for children, which has been shown to reverse myopia or nearsightedness in children if it's 120 minutes a day outside for a week. And there are public health campaigns in Singapore where there are posters on walls asking parents to have their kids outside and play freely for 120 minutes a day to fight myopia and to get off devices, which might be responsible for that change in their vision. So uh, I think eco-medicine is where food as medicine was 20 or 25 years ago. When I was talking about it then, people said, you're just a hippie. That actually wasn't really true. I wasn't really a hippie, but I was really interested in how food tasted and looked. But now it's much more mainstream. People care that the food that they eat is healthy. They care that where it comes from. They care how it was raised. Yeah, they're seeing it firsthand. And I think the concept of eco-medicine, getting people back outside to really reconnect to nature and understand how sick everything is, that nature, the earth, us is so important. And it goes back to something I talk about all the time on this podcast, and you and I have talked about offline a lot, but the concept of plant blindness and how disconnected we are from the natural world due to screens and the way that society has evolved and how important it is to kind of figure out how to pull the string, you know, to reconnect us again. And gardening is an amazing way to do that. Getting back to literally figuring out how to grow your own food, which how many people, I mean, I was 30 years old when I saw my first eggplant flower and couldn't believe that it was purple and freaked out. So many people don't really understand how food grows anymore. They think that herbs come in packets at, you know, the plastic boxes at the grocery store. And so I want to absolutely have you back on the podcast to talk more about ego medicine. But today I think we're just in the perfect time to dive into your expertise in culinary medicine. It's the end of the summer. We've all got epic harvests in our garden and why not dive even deeper in the connection to whatever we've grown and understanding how it serves our health. So do you want to kind of dial back and talk a little bit about culinary medicine? And you wrote an amazing book on it and and have spent many years lecturing about it and kind of what we need to know as gardeners. Sure. I think that'd be fun. You know, that's the other wonderful thing about gardening. It's kind of a gateway to nature. Totally. It's a gateway drug. Yeah. It is a gateway drug. And that has to do with preparedness and it has to do with security. A lot of people want to grow their own food because they don't like the idea of grocery stores being empty. And we had that recently. And they do want to be prepared for whatever happens in the future. And developing these skills is a really easy way to do that. But it is a skill. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story 
stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, culinary medicine, which you referred to, is blending the art of cooking with the science of medicine to create restaurant-quality meals that help to prevent and treat disease. And I taught the first class in it with my friend Mike Roizen, who is now the Emeritus Professor and Founding Director of the Cleveland Clinic Wellness Institute in 2003 in Syracuse and upstate near you. And now it's taught in about 50% of medical schools, where medical students have to learn something about cooking and food before they leave, which is essential since our diet is such an essential part of health. In gardening, there are so many things to say about gardening that and cooking together. But I think one of them is that when you grow something yourself, just like that kohlrabi stir fry you just spoke of, you know how much work it went into it. You know how hard it was. You know how much of the plant is left in the ground or that you had to compost or that maybe a gopher got. And so you want to use as much of the plant as you can. And that's something that home gardeners don't have an advantage of over grocery stores. Yeah. When you see a broccoli in a grocery store, it's kind of, you know, trimmed within an inch of its life. It's got like half of its stem, all the little grody broccoli parts that are on the outside, which have the most anti-inflammatory chemicals, just like the leaves on the outside of a lettuce have the most anti-inflammatory chemicals. Why is that? Because they've spent their whole gardening life, their life in the garden, fighting off predators, fighting off insects, fighting off bugs, and have developed more protective substances than the tender leaves on the inside, which have been encased the whole time. Yes, I'm not making this up. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, so gardeners have an anti-inflammatory leg up when they grow lettuce, broccoli, kohlrabi, cabbage, even Brussels sprouts. Carrots, you can do so many things with carrot greens. Absolutely. There's mm-hmm. pesto R us. Mm-hmm. So I love using as much of the plant as I can in a vegetable garden, including, you mentioned carrots, letting some of them go to seed. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that in the carrot case is that this is true for caraway and dill and fennel and anything else that's umbiliferous, which means, as you know, that it forms an umbel, like an umbrella. It will attack, attract beneficial insects that will be predatory upon the insects that are otherwise eating your vegetables. So letting caraway and fennel and dill and even carrot go to seed allows them to form this umbel, attracts beneficial to insects to the garden, allows you to use fewer pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, particularly synthetic artificial ones, which brings me to the third point, which is that you ought not to use those in your garden. I don't have as much of an objection to fertilizers, although they have their own problems that are artificial. But I think home gardeners really have a fascinating and powerful opportunity to grow everything organic. I am gardening with a friend this summer because I had this unexpected move in the middle of the summer. She has had four decades of the most unbelievable soil I've ever touched, organic garden. And One of the best delights is walking around her garden and pulling lettuce right off the plant and eating it and not worrying about, you know, really having to wash it. I mean, you might get a slug and that's disgusting. But yeah, like that ability and freedom with growing organically is so rewarding and another opportunity to just connect with your plants on such an intimate level, obviously. I think so. And another thing that it rewards there is flavor. One of the principles of culinary medicine is that food ought to be savored Mm -hmm. and that the pleasure of eating, the pleasure of dining, the pleasure of food is a lot about appreciation. And if you appreciate food more, you tend to eat less because you're focusing on the experience in a meditative or even non-meditative way. And so you taste 
differences in taste and flavor. You observe texture, you observe color, and those are the components of food that intrigue the palate and the brain. And when you eat less and savor more, you become healthier. I want that on a t-shirt, eat less, savor more. Eat less, savor more. That's awesome. Yeah. I, if you want to talk about patience, man, oh, I'm still waiting for most of our tomatoes to ripen. And I grew tomatoes from seed this year. It's been, you know, five months. I've been dreaming, six months I've been dreaming about these tomatoes and watching them just tease me like they're just not ripening quite yet. And the sun golds were the first to ripen. So we got to, you know, I think we had six, six or seven only. And I brought them home for my fiance and we've been like parceling these tiny sun golds out. And it is very interesting. Each one is an experience and it's not just like, whereas I've seen Billy eat an entire carton of sun golds that like he buys, you know, in the plastic thing at the grocery store, but these are like so different, but the flavor is so much more vibrant. They're almost savory. It's like really wild. Yeah, I think that's a really nice observation. The broccoli I mentioned, when you pluck it off the stalk, it's actually sweet. Yeah. Most have people have no idea that broccoli is sweet when it's grown, when you grow it yourself. Instead, it's been carted from 2,000 miles away. And sometimes even at the farmer's market, if it was picked three days ago, some of those sugars have started converted to starches and the bitters elements have come up. Lettuces too. Lettuces too, which is why I think and lettuces and radishes and turnips, I think, are the three easiest things to grow. Turnips take a little longer unless you use baby turnips. But of course, you can use the greens for each of these. I eat the lettuce core because it's not as bitter as the core in the store. And what I said about the outside of the leaves of a head of lettuce has been shown in romaine, among others. And the darker the lettuce, the more polyphenols, the more anthocyanins, the more pigment chemicals that are generally higher anti-inflammatory because they're darker colored. And that's also true for tomatoes. Purple Cherokees, for example, have much greater anthocyanin content and much greater anti-inflammatory content than, than a sun gold, for example, not just because of its difference in their sizes, but also because of the difference in the chemical composition. And absorbing the lycopene from both of them, although the purple Cherokee has a lot more of it, that gives it the red-orange look. And that's what the, makes tomatoes look red and orange is the antioxidant called lycopene inside is absorbable, more absorbable when you add a little bit of healthy fat like olive oil. If you cook your tomatoes, the lycopene, which is a diamond shaped molecule right underneath the skin, breaks down more quickly and you absorb more of the good stuff that helps to protect your heart. If you're a man, helps to protect your prostate. There's some evidence for women in breast cancer that lycopene, which you can buy as a supplement in Costco and CVS and Walgreens, you get more of it if you cook your tomatoes with a little bit of healthy fat. Is it the heat or is it the fat pairing, like the olive oil pairing? It's both. It's just okay. like curcumin and turmeric. The diamond-shaped molecule, which is strong, mm -hmm. breaks down. So it degrades quickly. And then because lycopene is fat-soluble, like all the carotenoids, which are all the colorful chemicals in the carotenoid family, that's what makes the yellow tomato yellow. It makes a yellow squash yellow. makes a yellow bell pepper yellow. It's a yellow carotenoid are all more easily absorbable with a little bit of healthy fat. And there are more tricks like that in cooking. In the garden, you can be happy to grow both and pluck them off the vine and don't wait till you get inside to glug the olive oil or drip, drizzle it with put some, some mozzarella on it, which would also work. But instead, just enjoy and savor the flavors in the garden. You and I are going to riff. You know, we both have an Italian heritage. You're obviously a professional chef. I love to cook. My mom, I come from a lineage of amazing Italian cooks. But like the simplest Italian dish, which my mom makes all the time, little did she know. I mean, it's not cooked, but thinly sliced tomatoes, drizzled in olive oil, then nice sea salt and diced basil. And it's just, oh, sorry. And mozzarella. It's the best freaking thing. Like we have it yeah. for dinner every night because in the summer- she grows a lot of tomatoes. Good for her. Maybe you can visit her and get her tomato tips. I know I need, <laughs> I need to. But yeah, it's like such a simple dish, but little did she know that's actually kind of the right pairing. No, I, and they're companionable flavors, not just in the dish, but also in the ground. I mean, that's, you grow basil next to tomatoes as a companion plant, mm -hmm. not just because they taste good together, but because basil in the ground has such a strong odor to insects that it actually ward some of them away. That's why basil and tomatoes are companion plants because 
the basil scent is objectionable to some predators, although not to the hornworms that were eating my tomatoes earlier this year. So I had to pick them off and drown them one by one. Oh, no. Melody, my friend, makes me pick the slugs. She has a lot of slugs in her garden. She makes me pick them up and then sometimes she makes me smoosh them, but I don't like it. I don't like insects in general. Yeah, I try not to smoosh them. I did drown a few, but I toss the others to the bird. Someone was telling me today, I don't know if this is right, so don't fact check me, don't at me, plant friends, if I'm wrong, but someone was telling me today that they put like beer, like a bottle of beer or a glass of beer yeah, in the for garden. Slugs and slugs and snails. Yeah, it's so interesting. But yeah, anyway. they're attracted to the sugar in it and then they don't get out. That's the interesting thing about different types of gardening habitats. You don't have slugs or snails. And the reason is that it is so dry in California that I can't imagine keeping soil moist, even with four inches of alfalfa mulch, which is what I have over tomatoes and peppers and squash and everything else. And in wood chips, I have tons literally of wood chips all around my avocado and citrus trees. It just, the snails would never make it because it's not moist enough anywhere on the property. Interesting. Yeah. Meanwhile, we've had like the wettest spring and summer ever out here. But that's how what good gardeners do. They kind of, they know that it's going to change. They know that the weather's unpredictable. It's something you can't control. So you, you do adapt and you just, you believe that some of the crop is for the animals and the insects because absolutely you have to grow. You got to share. You do. You're sharing your land with them. You got to share some of your crops with them. So let's talk about some basic culinary medicinal principles before we dive into a couple of things that we all grow. Let's talk about herbs briefly from a culinary, is it culinary medicinal from a culinary medicine perspective, better to cook dried herbs or fresh herbs for the benefit's sake? For the benefit's sake, dried herbs have more antioxidants okay. than fresh ones, and they have fewer vitamins. Okay. So the fresh herbs have more vitamins. Fresh herbs have more vitamins. The dried herbs have more antioxidants, anti-inflammatory chemicals. But both are good. If you wanted to kind of supersize it, you would do the opposite of what good cooking would normally suggest. Good cooking would normally suggest you add dried herbs at the beginning and you finish with a garnish of fresh herb, right? Mm -hmm. So think of just a basic tomato sauce. You're adding dried oregano and rosemary and marjoram to the base of the sauteed onion and garlic and cooking the dried herbs to get out their fat soluble flavors. And then when the tomato sauce is finished and you're spooning it over pasta or whatever else, you're using some of the fresh basil or the same herbs in the base of the sauce in their fresh form instead of dried form. And that's, I think, a way to optimize flavor to it's traditional, it works, why mess with it? But if you want to get extra anti-inflammatory power in your dishes, you will also add dried herbs as a garnish. Interesting to get the antioxidants. Right. Interesting. You had posted on Instagram today about turmeric. Turmeric, yes. And makes curries yellow and it's a rhizome. And I think I first began writing about it 15 years ago. You can now buy it in Costco among other places in, in the little rhizomes. And it's not that hard to grow. It's like ginger in many ways, because ginger is also a rhizome, but you do need moist, well-draining soil and uh, adequate light. And we don't have enough moist draining soil for me to grow it, except for in a pot, which I don't want to do because I have enough land. So the same principles about getting the most curcumin, which is the good stuff in turmeric, out of turmeric, apply a little bit of heat, a little bit of healthy fat. And in curcumin's taste, case, a little bit of black pepper, because the piperine in black pepper, which is what makes black pepper spicy, makes the curcumin bioavailable. It complexes with it so you can absorb it more easily. Without black pepper, you don't actually absorb much of the curcumin. So what's the best way to use turmeric and black pepper with a garden harvest? How do you like to use it? I like it as a base for a sauce. For me, powdered turmeric is bitter. I think sliced fresh bitter is interesting as a garnish on a yogurt or in a creme fraiche or 
recently I made a kumquat cello with kumquat and alcohol and honey. And that could have used some turmeric, although I didn't have any fresh, to flavor the simple syrup with the, uh, I made for the kumquat alcohol. Talk about that, please. <laughs> um, kumquats are really fun to use, and, and we have two trees. And I bought some Absolute, which apparently you're not supposed to buy here, in a Polish liquor store, and incubated the kumquats for six months. Did you dice them or you put them in whole? Put them in whole. Ooh. So that only the out external, all the flavor compounds in citrus, or many of them anyway, are in the zest. And most of the anti-inflammatory ones are. And some interestingly anti-cholinesterol ones are. The, we also grow bergamot oranges, which are used in Calabria in Southern Italy as an extract is used as a cholesterol medication. And bergamot's also used in Chanel number no. five and a number of other really high fragrance things. So the active compounds in many citrus are in the zest. And we, as I mentioned, don't spray anything with chemicals. And so I just uh, marinated the kumquats in absolute and high strength vodka for six months, strained it, and then uh, melted a jar of 32 ounce jar of honey into it. And which we keep bees, so the honey was good. And then I infused water with ginger on the stove for an hour and then just diluted it to taste. Thank you to our episode sponsor, Deer Busters. Plant friends, if you're struggling with deer and wildlife in your gardens in the growing season, you might want to consider a deer fence. You've heard me discuss this a lot on the podcast this year as I have ventured into my first major gardening season. And here's the thing, what I've really learned in this whole gardening podcast series isn't even about plants. If you live anywhere moderately rural with wildlife, you really probably need wildlife fencing if you don't want just a complete headache and so many disappointments in your garden. What I have realized since I moved to the Catskills, which is upstate New York, there's a lot of land. I drive around like a maniac, like 10 miles an hour on these roads because I just want to look at everybody's garden because I would say probably 80% of the people up here have gardens, at least the people who live here full time. But of the people that have gardens up here, 100% of them have fencing. I think it's just a part of being a gardener if you live in an area that has a lot of wildlife pressure. And I polled our listener community about this, and I know that it's one of the biggest stressors for their outdoor gardens this year was not managing their plants, but managing the local wildlife in a kind way. So this partnership with Deerbusters is your answer. Deerbusters makes these super easy to install fencing kits that solve this problem you do not need to have a handyman or be super handy to install them. They come with everything you need to install. No crazy hardware or contractors required. And they're completely customizable by linear feet, corners, ends, gates, tensioning, and or extra rodent barriers. And they really aim to help you easily build a wildlife fence that works for you depending on what your vision is. So if you need a wildlife fence, check them out. You can visit DeerBusters.com and use code BLOOM at checkout for 10% off your deer fence kit. Plant friends, if you're looking for a way to meet your plant's lighting needs and help your plants grow, Soltec Solutions has the product for you. You've heard me talk about Soltec a million times. They're an OG sponsor of the show. They're the first grow light I ever got, I think. Soltec's mission is to make the integration of plants into indoor spaces as beautiful and effortless as possible. With their collection of grow lights, they have a solution that works best for you, your home, and your plants whether it's their track lighting system, their pendant lighting system, or the recent launch of their Vita LED grow bulb. It's a bulb that simply screws into any of the traditional light fixtures that you have in your house, and it helps illuminate your plants and give them the light and life that they deserve. The Vita works with any normal light bulb and provides a beautiful warm white light, giving off that photosynthetic spectrum that your plants need to grow, but looking like any other normal light bulb. And they have a special bundle for you featuring the Vita Grow Bulb. It's called the Green Fit Bundle. You basically buy four Vitas and you get one free. So you get, I guess, four Vitas for the price of three. And that's a savings of up to $85. The Green Fit Bundle allows you to create more plant-friendly spaces throughout your home without having to worry about your plant getting enough light. I am certainly screwing in several Vita light bulbs in my new home as I style it. If you want to do that as well, you can check it out for yourself at soltechsolutions.com and save today. Happy plants, happy home. It's that easy. Yum. 
Did you try one of those kumquats or did you compost them? Oh, no. I made a kumquat jam with them. You did? I was going to say, like, that reminds me, like, in college, we used to, like, soak gummy bears in vodka and then eat the gummy bears. I, legally, I was 21. But it's like a nice, juicy vodka kumquat. It's a more organic approach. It's really the same. <laughs> it just has less gelatin. <laughs> not recommend, not advising anyone to do this who's not over 21. Please drink responsibly. Disclaimer. Maybe a little less corn syrup, too, maybe. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Than the gummy but bears. Yeah, this is very easy to do. I mean, that's and so you fun. Can do it, yeah. I just make sure you buy organic citrus because these days citrus is sprayed quite a lot. And then that is going to come out it when you soak it from the peel. Right. Interesting. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And that's again why home gardeners have such an advantage. Whatever you spray in your garden goes directly into your body. I think if you're not willing to eat it, then you shouldn't be spray it on your garden. Yeah. No, that's totally fair. And I love what you say about using as many aspects of the plant that you can, that like if you buy garlic at the grocery store, then you can't have the garlic scape in the spring and then the actual garlic in the fall or, you know, all the other things that we mentioned. It doesn't mean that you don't buy them in the store because you still have to eat garlic in February. But it does mean that when you have it in your own backyard or on a windowsill, if it's a marjoram and rosemary and thyme plant, which are almost full of fruit, Mint certainly is bulletproof. I did a TikTok video in which I said that rosemary was bulletproof and I tried to demonstrate how. And I got a lot of blowback saying, no, no, I've killed rosemary. It isn't. But if you want something even more bulletproof than rosemary in a windowsill garden, try mint. Yeah, mint is just the best. I mean, the most faithful friend of the herbs. Very hard, very hard to kill. Mint. It does Apple really mint. I love apple Pineapple mint. mint. Yeah. Pineapple mint is just invasive. Yeah. Keep it in a pot. Right. I would not put it in the ground actually. Yeah. So what's your favorite herb that you're growing right now? And what thing are you cooking with said herb? Let's see. One of my favorite herbs is Mexican oregano, which is not Mediterranean or Greek or Syrian, uh, all of which I grow too, but have different flavor profiles. And in fact, it's not even the same family, same genus. And it just makes... It's savory and slightly bitter. You can eat the flowers. It's very pretty. And it's essential, I think, with avocado, with many Mexican dishes, ranging from moles to a folding inside of a quesadilla. You can often find it in Hispanic grocery stores, not so much in standard grocery stores, although I'm seeing it more in places like Bonds and Safeway. Certainly Whole Foods will have it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gelson's will have it out here. Now look for it because it's a really different set of flavor profiles. And it's just as drought tolerant as oregano and relatively easy to grow, but it forms a shrub like an oregano, Mediterranean, Syrian oreganos often do not. Syrian can, but most Mediterranean Greek oreganos are more ground hugging. Uh, This forms a, I have one that's a four foot shrub and you just break off a branch and, and a new one appears. It often appears dead, but it's not. And it comes back really easily. Again, as a garnish, as I said, right on top or at the base of a sauce, like a mole or a barbecue sauce even, I think it's outstanding and really interesting and a little bit offbeat. All your friends will be super impressed. Mm, I love that. I've had a delicious dish the other day that I want to replicate at home with actually mint, our easy mint friend. But in the summer, watermelon, mint, and feta. It wasn't feta. It was a different cheese, but feta, watermelon feta and mint is like such an amazing flavor. Yeah. And black pepper. And black pepper. Yeah. And I like coconut oil, but you could do like most people do olive oil on it. Halloumi, grilled halloumi. Yeah. Grilled halloumi. Right. Josie, my sweetheart does grilled halloumi and she, yeah, it is really meaty, isn't it? Um, and dense. Yeah. It's a terrific grilling cheese. And a lot of Greek cheeses are really terrific grilling cheeses. Uh, That's a wonderful idea. The mint is so bright and just like cuts through it. And the sweet and savory of the cheese and the watermelon, which also people grow, but then the mint is so fun. So I think let's start. So we're going to walk through a couple of commonly grown plants and then some fun medicinal facts about them and then also some ideas. So my favorite 
it's a simple plant, but man, growing your own chives and scallions and using them, they're so abundant. It's so easy to just grab a couple, dice them up. That was a big thing when Billy and I started growing plants successfully is putting chives in our scrambled eggs every day. And yeah. like literally that act of just snipping and putting in. So can we talk about alliums a little bit? Sure. I think that's a great idea. I love that. It's also very tactile. You get yes. you get not just the flavor of it, but you also get the feeling of the onion. You get the scent of the onion. And of course, you're seeing it as you mm-hmm. cut it. We often use scissors for that, just easy, any kind of scissors. I use the ones in my Swiss Army knife because that's usually what I have. But I remember doing that too when I was first getting more interested in cooking as a way of, of reminding myself that I could be connected. I think that's a great gateway as well. Alliums generally, as you know, are everything from shallots and chives and garlic chives to leeks uh, and white red and and yellow onions. I especially like torpedo onions, which look like torpedoes and are really terrific to grill and are, are red as well. You know, there are in classes and classes of vegetables to grow there that are really good for you in the culinary medicine kitchen mm-hmm. pantry. There is the cruciferous vegetables, some of which we've already begun to talk about, kohlrabi's one. And then there are the alliums. If you have Mm -hmm. to pick two big classes, that's it. Wow. Okay. Which, you know, leaves you wanting about tomatoes since that's everybody's favorite thing to grow. But still, from a culinary medicine standpoint, those are the most powerful ones, leaving aside herbs and spices. And as you know, herbs are leaves and spices are everything else on the plant. Mm -hmm. Spices is a seed, a root a flower, a bud, herbs, or leaves. So alliums are terrific sources of quercetin, which is a really powerful anti-inflammatory that was actually tested in supplements against COVID-19 early in its course and found to delay its growth, but wasn't used as part of the armamentarium because people were concentrating on hospital-based therapies. But it has some activity against viruses. And yet the, the very best way to eat onions And many plants, although not all, is raw or lightly cooked. And there are some things that get better if you cook them, like there's more fiber in a cooked carrot than there is in a plain carrot, because it's just more easily accessible. There's more vitamin C in cooked corn if it's steamed than in fresh corn becomes accessible. But most things are best raw or lightly cooked. It doesn't mean you can't cook them for six hours if you're stewing beef hocks or something, and you have four pounds of onions at the bottom of a pan, it makes a luscious caramelized sauce and you should do it. But you also might consider adding a little bit of the raw vegetable on top, uh, maybe both as a garnish and to remind yourself of its connection. And a different texture too. Exactly. Having a nice crunch. Texture is the missing component in great food 80% of the time. Yeah, totally. It's funny though. I totally cook like onions. I totally cook and on, overcook onions all the time. I just put them at the base of like ev- anything I cook and it's, they're always the first thing in the pan. So what are your favorite ways to eat onions raw or lightly cooked? I like a charred onion on a grill. I like a charred onion on a grill, not raw, really, but lightly cooked. <laughs> lightly cooked. <laughs> not I like raw. a charred onion on a grill. I actually char the uh, garlic scapes and the onion Ooh. flowers. So onions, as you know, onions bolt Mm -hmm. if they're stressed. Um, And about a quarter of mine bolted this year because they got irregular water. And onion flowers don't taste quite as good as garlic scapes, but the flower, the terminal part of the flower does, just not the base part of the flower, which is thick and hollow and not very appealing. So I like them just like whole scallions on a grill the same way, charred. And they're called cebollitas in Spanish. And we used to serve them at Topo Bombo when I worked there uh, as a garnish. But they're so good that we make them here anyway. All you do is slick the whole green onion in olive oil, put it in a grill, char it, flip it, char it again, you're done. Or do it to the, with the garlic scape that's 12 inches long. Slick it, char it, flip it, char it, you're done. Um, and eat it as a garnish, a side tacos or a sandwich or a bowl of anything. That sounds amazing. Okay, what what's give me a real raw recipe <laughs> since you call since you, since you called me out for the fact that grilling it is not raw. <laughs> True, isn't it? You know, what I do is slice leeks super thin 
and shallots super thin because you can really only eat them raw if they are super thin. Totally. Because it's the flavors are too sharp. You just asked me for the, you know, the best medical way to do it. And that is the best medical way. But to make that palatable, wherever they appear, they have to be in super thin form or else you're not going to eat them. I actually like them in salads, but then your partner has to remember you're having dinner with or going to kiss later, needs to have them too. And it's really kind of stops there. One of my favorite ways to, to use onions is to rinse them in apple cider vinegar. So if I'm adding them to a guacamole or to any other dish in which they're going to appear crunchy and fresh, you put them in the base of a strainer. You put the strainer in a little stainless steel bowl. You add the chopped or sliced onion to the strainer. You add a quarter cup of apple cider vinegar. You take your fingers and mix around the chopped or sliced onion. You wait 10 or 15 seconds. You empty out the vinegar and then you rinse it with water. And all the heat of the onion will have gone away. Really? I've never heard of that before. That's cool. I'm going to try that. Yeah, it's a chef's trick. Oh, I love that. It kind of reminds me, but I don't know if this counts as raw, like those delicious marinated onions that like, you know, you marinate them in like vinegar and oil and like all sorts of spices. Does the vinegar do something to make it not as nutritious or does that count as a raw onion? Let's count it. Let's count count it. it. Because those are delicious on like a burger or really anything. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So that's Allium. So those are some great onion ideas. Let's talk about rucola. Rucola. The best lettuce available. I think it's a very underrated lettuce. Totally. I think it's so delicious. I think it's very versatile. And isn't it like one of the more nutritious of the lettuces? It is. And that's because it's cruciferous. So cruciferous vegetables, arugula, broccoli, cauliflower, daikon, radish, anything of that ilk, turnips, collards, when they bloom, form a four-pointed cross. So cruciferous cross, four-pointed. When you let arugula bloom or broccoli rob or broccoli itself, it forms beautiful little flowers that you can eat and thin stems, which you can eat. And we do. Cruciferous vegetables are, as I said, one of the two families which are most powerful in culinary medicine. And that's because they have primary detoxification qualities. They work in the liver to enhance the detoxification cycles of poisons that we routinely ingest. And the body interprets poisons as everything from alcohol to antibiotics to pesticides and herbicides to heavy metals. And all these things the body correctly looks at as poisons that it has to detoxify before it gets rid of them. And the liver performs that function and cruciferous vegetables help it perform that function, especially when they too are raw. Now, there's a trick in cruciferous vegetables that isn't, doesn't work the same way for alliums, but does work in cruciferous vegetables and has been shown in several different studies, which is that you cook the cruciferous vegetable any way you want. Arugula, I only cook when it's gone to, almost gone to seed mm-hmm. and the leaves are really big and it's kind of bitter and I want to soften the flavors and make it more like a escarole or something. Then that's when I cook it. And if I wanted to retain its detoxification powers, I would simply add a tablespoon of it raw to the same dish like we talked about with the alliums, because that magically reactivates the enzymes in the arugula. So it really? can detoxify in the liver. I am not making this up. So you cook the cruciferous vegetables, arugula or whatever else. Broccoli, cauliflower. You just have to add some raw at the end. Right. I love this trick. I'm going to, it's, I don't even know if it's, it's called a, a trick. Like the third trick, the third trick I taught you. Yeah, yeah I love it. I'm going to totally use that. But yeah, I just think arugula of the lettuces, it's so peppery and spicy and delicious. And I love it on sandwiches. Like It's my favorite lettuce. No question. It's the best. And there's a wasabi arugula. Did you know that? So yeah, too spicy for me. Oh, sorry. But it's it's delicious if people like spicy. If people like wasabi, you'll like that that type of arugula. (laughs) Another thing we can't grow because wasabi grows in a stream. Yes. I did watch a YouTube video about that the other day. Excellent. Very interesting. I know. But yeah, okay, so that's super interesting. Now, I do have to ask you, so any other ways that you like arugula? 
Uh, I like it in a pesto. Yeah. So I like anything in pesto. So good. Yeah. Which is actually the point of a pesto. You can easily use almost any green vegetable with a personality in the pesto. You can actually use any nut. You don't have to use pine nuts. You don't even have to toast them. We use walnuts a lot. Walnuts give a meatier pesto. It's a more yeah, it's like crunchy. Pesto. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. And of course you get the omega-3s in walnuts much better than you do with any other nut actually. That was something I've learned. I mean, the Italian in me thinks basil only, but you can do carrot greens, dandelion greens, arugula. What else can we make pesto out of? Anything. Any other green. Yeah. Turnip greens, really any other greens, radish greens. I've used radish greens. So you can even use lettuces if they're extremely bitter. You just get, they're more watery. So you have to kind of make up for it with more substantial things. I often use avocado instead of olive oil in a, in a pesto. Oh, yum. What you want is the fat to make those flavors more available. And also you often want more substance, especially if you're using something like salad greens, which are very light. And so the avocado adds more bulk, not just liquid. Yum. Oh, I love that tip. Okay. I could wax poetic with you about food forever. Let's do one more. Sweet potato. Because sweet potato, a lot of people grow and it's another like unsung nutritional hero, right? In our gardens. Yes, that's right. It is. I like sweet potato, especially because of the leaves. You had mentioned that and I've actually never eaten the leaves. So how do you do that? I know. Well, they won't bite you. You can bite them. <laughs> it's a salad grain. They're best thought of as a spinach. So you treat them as a, a hearty spinach, a Bloomfield kind of spinach. So you steam it briefly, saute it if you like. We grow primarily Okinawan potatoes which are the purple ones. And so the leaves are purple. They're also gorgeous as a ground cover. You should not plant them near anything that needs surface water. And I made that mistake with my persimmons. I put all these Okinawan potatoes, sweet potatoes near the persimmons and they sucked up a lot of the water and persimmons are not deep rooted. So didn't like it. So I had to dig them all up and replant them. So they ought to be planted in a part of the garden that just needs ground cover. And use it as a ground cover. And then if you like, uh, plant something that's more deep rooted, even an apple tree actually would work really well. And in fact, sweet potato is part of what in permaculture is known as a guild for apple trees, along with garlic and artichoke. And the guild of vegetables and fruits around another tree are vegetables and fruits that serve other functions, either as shade or as protection from insects or to increase yield in a vertical space. Interesting. Okay. And then what about my favorite part, the potato part? The potato part. Well, you can tell how good it is for you by its color. It is often a vibrant purple. That doesn't mean that the white ones aren't good for you. They're, they're just obviously sweeter. And you can tell that just by looking. That's one of the other great things about gardening is that it, you don't need a book for nutrition. You can use your garden. And I think my favorite way to do sweet potatoes is high temperature roasted in a pan. Okay. So cut into a batons. I never peel them because most of the vitamins are under the skin or immediately under the skin. So I never peel those. Is that a rule of thumb for all like vegetables with skin that we should try to keep the skins on? Or is that a sweet potato thing? I meant it as a sweet potato thing. I don't mean it for kohlrabi because the skin is inedible or a daikon, or rather a uh, jicama. The skin's also pretty much inedible. But whenever something has a skin, I try not to take it off if it's at all edible, because that's where the vitamins are. And also because it adds that element that you mentioned, texture, to the dish. So for sweet potato fries, which you could do in an instant fryer, but I don't have one. And I also don't coat them, because I think if I get it hot enough, and the oil is used uh, around the sweet potato to transmit heat instead of a separate ingredient. So you can dunk the sweet potato batons into oil, but that would be way too much. They really just need a slick and actually a really light slick. You could even use cooking spray for it because all you're doing is conducting the heat. The heat has to be high enough, 500, and, and they all have to be pre-salted. And the best way to do it is to pre-salt it for 15 minutes, go away, come back, pat them off so that they're super dry, put them either on parchment paper or just a plain sheet pan 
spray them with oil or toss them with oil, salt, pepper again, and then into the oven. Yeah, maybe a little rosemary in there. You could do rosemary, I sure, or thyme, or marjoram, or curry powder, or cardamom. That is kind of kicks it up. Dried cardamom, one of my favorite spices, offer under underused. Really? How do you like to use that? The same way I like to use zatar. I like to sort of use it as a visible garnish. Okay. You can use it kind of under layers. I referenced a barbecue sauce before or, a, or any other kind of tomato-based sauce or vinegar-based sauce for that matter. But I think seeing it kind of reminds you of its presence and gives you a jolt of flavor when you don't expect it. I love its particular its sourness and its savoriness at the same time. It makes me think of uh, Yoda Malagheni. I'm mispronouncing his name, but he's the well-known chef who writes a case for the New York Times and has uh, restaurants in London who has really done amazing work to democratize Middle Eastern food and make it really super accessible to Americans for, I would say, the last 10 years or more. Otto Lenghi. He's Israeli born and he's British. His six books called Otto Lenghi Simple. His last one is called Plenty, I think, uh, or actually the second to last one, another one called Jerusalem. He uses just wild things like tahini and brownies, which it seems so obvious, but he did it in a way that really elevated it. He does sweet potatoes with oregano and feta. He just had a piece in the, the Guardian a couple of days ago about this. So yeah, he's one of my inspirations in cooking. Shout out. We'll link to him in the show notes. That's awesome. So, okay. You've given us so many ideas. I can't wait to try some of the things that we discussed. I'll definitely be incorporating at least more raw elements to whatever I cook moving forward. This is kind of, you know, culinary medicine. Your book has been out for a while. You're now kind of moving into the eco-medicine comfort nature space. So Talk to me about comfort nature, because I know that this is where you're putting a lot of your energy towards right now. You have an amazing quiz on your website that I've taken that I've loved. So talk to me a little bit about it and what the next steps for Dr. John LaPuma are. Everybody has a comfort food, you know, a totally. food that you eat. French fries. And yeah. There you go. <laughs> Maybe sweet potato fries with that rosemary on it. So I think everybody has a comfort nature place too, a place that you can go physically when you're stressed. Because that's when people eat a lot of comfort food, when they're stressed. And comfort food is really super interesting because it's personal, it's cultural, it's social, it's familial, it's historical. It has a lot of really interesting characteristics to it. It's different for men and women. Comfort nature place is also different for men and women. And it's also cultural and it's also familial. It's a place that you go when you're stressed. If you think back in your childhood, was there a nature place that I could go that was meaningful to me? that allowed me to sort of be myself and breathe and get away from whatever I was trying to get away from. If there isn't that place, and there isn't for some people, then that's why we invented the Comfort Nature Quiz, because it will actually give you a dozen different kinds of places that you might enjoy as your Comfort Nature Place. And we just linked MP3's little music files to each of them so you can listen to that place and see if in fact is your comfort nature place and we make recommendations for you to try these places because as we talked about it's really important for people to get not just connected with nature but use it as part of their preparedness part of their self-sufficiency and also part of living healthy and living well and finding your comfort nature place is a lot of as a first step to finding a way into nature. Totally. And it was interesting taking the quiz because there are so many different options. To me, like I think of nature as the woods because that's where I am and that's what I do. But you had the beach, you had a pond, you had all of these different, a city park. Like there are all of these different ways that people can engage with nature that makes you be like, oh yeah, like this looks different for everyone. And each person is going to be comfortable in different areas. Like I am kind of terrified of the ocean. I like being at the beach, but swimming in the ocean makes me really stressed out. But I love being in water. Swimming in a pool makes me really like I get that feeling in a pool or in a pond. And it is, it's very personal. And the quiz is extremely thorough. It it really makes you like think about these things. Thank you. And actually if you can't go to a pool or a swimming pool and water is your comfort nature place, you can actually go there kind of in the shower. 
you can have some of the same sense of running water in the or shower. Or a bath, yeah, totally. Or a bath, yeah. And that's the thing about a comfort nature place. Many of us can't visit us now because we can't travel. Yep. But we can visit by bringing the outside in and finding those factors that are inside that resemble our comfort nature space. Like house plants. <laughs> yes, like house plants. And for some people, that is their comfort nature place, as you well know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So that's a powerful thing. And we want to endorse that. You don't actually have to be outside in nature if your comfort nature place is inside among your plants. But we want to know if there's a place outside that does it for you too. Totally. And you have a great blog that dives much deeper into the thing that I love about you is you can spit out all the different fancy words and the science stuff. And you have great blogs on different profiles of like the studies behind why we are more relaxed in nature and more about this. So where can people find you, learn more from you, take this quiz? We'll obviously link them all in the show notes, but where can we find you? Quiz is comfortnaturequiz.com. It's simple. And uh, people can find me at drjohnlapuma.com or on Twitter at and Instagram at John LaPuma. Don't you forget TikTok. You're on TikTok now, buddy. You got to plug it. I do. John LaPuma there. And, and as you know, and I know much to your envy, my tomato video has 200,000 <laughs> views. Can you believe what a that? Thing. Your tomato video is, <laughs> I'm very excited. I'm supportive as your plant friend. You're not John. really supportive. You're not, you're not, you're not really. I wish you were though. <laughs> Very happy. Yes, you have a very good tomato. Actually, that's the way my grandma, my nonni used of to, course, to plant of her course. tomatoes. It's been around for 500 years. Yeah, mm-hmm. pla- about how John plants his tomatoes. But um, check him out. He's TikToking. He's there. All the other places, but take the test. It's really fun. Thank you, John. I can't wait to have you back to dive deeper into the plant person connection in 2022. But thank you for this. I can't wait to put some of these recipes to the test and definitely culinary medicine is in route. It's, it's been in route to my home in the woods. Can't wait to thumb through it. Can't wait to sign it for you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Great to see you, Maria. Thank you so much, Dr. John LaPuma, for joining me. He's a riot. I can't wait to visit him one day when I go out to California and see his farm. Do you guys want to do me a favor and help me in my TikTok war with Dr. John LaPuma and maybe go check out my TikTok account at Bloom and Grow Radio and just make one of my videos get over 300,000 views so I can just throw it in his face? (laughs) I'm kidding, but not. You should go follow me on TikTok if you haven't already. But anyway, I really enjoyed this conversation and I called my mom right after it and I've started using that adding the fresh chopped raw version of whatever plant you're cooking at the end into like basically every meal that I've been doing. And I told Mama Faella and she's doing it too. So let me know on Instagram what strategies and what plants and what recipes you use after listening to this episode. Keep me and John posted. So until next time, my sweet plant friends, I hope you're having fun. I hope you're soaking in the end of the summer, prepping for fall, which frankly is my favorite season. And until next time, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show. So thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and growradio.com slash personality and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. 
Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes, usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm.